Today's scripture reading is from John 17, 1 to 11. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal, now this eternal life, that they know you, the one only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I'll remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. John 17, 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, good morning, friends. Um, <clears throat> actually, I, as I was sitting here listening to the music, and particularly the first song, A Thousand Hallelujahs, and then the readings and the prayers, I thought to myself, I don't need to preach this morning. Everything that you need to know, you have heard in one way or another through the music or through the readings. Um, <clears throat> but of course, you know that won't stop me, so, uh, <laughs> because that's the way I am. You know, today we're looking at what is called the great priestly prayer uh, by many people. And uh, just a few considerations before we begin. Though John chapter 17 is not a long chapter, it's a very rich chapter. I think you understand what I mean. Theologically, there is much to be said in it. Um, in fact, in, in many times when I approach it at, at, at times such as this, I'm not even sure what themes I should even look at it. There, there are so many in it. And, and why do I say that as I'm starting? Well, I say that because it means we don't have time enough to unpack the whole chapter on a single Sunday morning. Uh, in fact, we are being selective about which verses we're even looking at today. So here's my challenge for you. Sometime in the next few days, read the whole chapter so that you're reminded of the whole picture, of the whole, the totality of it. And also, I apologize if, I, if I'm missing some of the, the verses that you would particularly like to, to, to have read and unpacked, but we have to make choices sometimes, and, and this is one of them. So as we look at it, I would challenge you also to look first at the setting, because it's important to hold the setting of this in place, and, and, and the time and the like. So, what do we see? Well, we see sunset is long past. The, the, the disciples have come together. The, the darkness, the, the shadows of the street have been replaced with darkness. And once again, the Passover meal, is, it with all of its food and drink, has, with its traditions and rites and its questions and all the things that go with it, that has now been finished as we look at the picture. In the, in the moments following, in, in the upper room, probably you can imagine in the flickering light of an oil lamp and with, a, with the warmth of the, the meals and everything all there in the room, these men come together, they gather around, and they sat around Jesus, and, and he told them so many things. Uh, he, he told them what was yet to come for him, 
and for them, of the troubles that, that would await them. Uh, he told them of the importance of maintaining their love for one another. And he told them of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And now, in the last moments, as before they arise and head out to the, to the garden, he, Jesus prays. He stops to pray. But not just for himself, but, but for those who had faithfully followed him from the beginning. And for those who would believe his message into the future, right down to the centuries, to us as we sit here. We hear his words as John, one of those present that day, has recorded them. And Jesus said this, he looked, as he looked towards heaven and prayed. And, and uh, just, just as a, before we pass away from that, that's the ancient attitude of prayer. Uh, we in the modern church tend to think of this as prayer. This is prayer, my friends, in the ancient church. That was prayer in the Hebrews. That was prayer, even if you look at, at pictures from the early churches, that's the way you saw people pray. Not when they did something that they were, were admitting as guilt or whatever, but, but when they were wanted to be one with God, they looked towards heaven and they prayed. So picture that. And here's what he says. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Now I know you heard that read just a few seconds ago, but it doesn't hurt to hear it again, does it? You know, to, to, to gather it in. Even now, as Jesus knows what's going to happen to him, in these words, we, we hear a prayer of, of, of adoration and worship. We hear a prayer of thanksgiving between the Father and the Son. We are also allowed insight into the relationship between the Father and the Son too. A very good insight. We are reminded that, that Jesus existed before the world, that even began, okay? And that he was in the presence of God, enjoying divine glory, and that he knows that he will return to that glory but only after enduring great pain and suffering. Quite honestly, I often find myself asking, and I may have even said this to you before, why? Why would he come down from his place of glory in heaven to do this for people such as me? What reason would there be for it? And as we look at the words closely, we can begin to understand, well, at least as, as much as we can in a human sense we can understand. But, you know, because we, we cannot understand the mind of God. But, but at least we can get a, a glimpse of why. And it's in those words. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. You got that? I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. This is talking to the Father. He's saying this. And here to me is one of the critical concepts in this prayer. One that has significance to us, especially in today's world. You see, Jesus came to this world to bring glory to the Father. That's what he's saying, to bring glory to the Father. That was his purpose, his, the reason he came. And, when, you know, and, and, and we have to remember that because when we, we read words like, you know, John 3.16, everybody knows that one, right? Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, right? Uh, you know, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Or we, we read Luke 19.10 where it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. All those are true. But it's, and it's, and it's easy, but it's easy to assume that Jesus' purpose was to save a lost humanity. That's not quite right. That was not his purpose. It was the method of fulfilling his purpose. His purpose, his purpose was to bring glory to the Father. And in saving people, he brings glory. He brings the glory that all of those saved souls bring with them. Now, the voices of all of those people praise him. And that's the glory that he brings to the Father. It actually, in many ways, as we think about this, it kind of reminds us of, those, of the great words in Philippians 2, which is... Uh, it's called the kenosis, the emptying chapter. And it reads like this, and most of you have heard these so many times. 
in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. You see the connection between those two. That's what he was doing. He was coming in the nature of a servant to fulfill the purpose to bring glory to the Father, to bring glory to the Father. And here's why this is significant for us. We live in a world that encourages us to put ourselves first. I don't know if you've noticed that. Everywhere around us, it's always about self. Uh, we are encouraged to ask questions like, uh, okay, what's in it for me, right? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a common one. We're told that we should pursue our own pleasure. Fun and happiness are what people say. Is it fun? Is it fun? You know, how can I be happy with it? Uh, you, and, and we hear lines, one of the ones that drives me nuts is, you can be anything you want to be if you try hard enough, right? You've heard that kind of thing. You can be anything you want to be. I want to be six foot eight and play in the NBA. Is that going to happen? Not likely, right? You can't always be whatever you want to be. But that's what our world says. Self, self, self. Uh, uh, it, it, this focus on self-interest is, is, is all around us. It's, self has become the god of our times. And sadly, somehow it's insinuated itself into, into the lives of Christians in many ways too, I believe. I think of the rise of the health, wealth, and prosperity churches. You, you know what I'm talking about, the ones that promise that if you believe hard enough, you have faith enough, God will pour wealth down upon you, and you'll be healthy, and you'll be happy. For a... No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible, the Bible tells us that God does not want us to be happy. He wants us to be holy, and that's quite a different thing than being happy. But, but the world says, oh no, that's the kind of thing you should, be, you, you, should be, you should be after. And even on a more subtle level, have you heard people, even Christians around you, saying things like this, I prayed for this and God didn't give it to me. I am so disappointed in him. He doesn't love me. He doesn't, is that what it means? No, it means that God has made choices and he's, we have to trust his goodness and the fact that he knows what's best for us. But self tells us something else, doesn't it? And sadly, that's what our world is like. So we come back to those verses. That's the whole point. You remember what it said at the very beginning of that? It said, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And what was Christ Jesus' mindset? To be a servant, to be a servant. And that's basically what we have to, we have to, to, to live on that and make that part of who we are. Even in our music, and, and, I, and I recognize that isn't, that isn't the whole of our worship, by the way. We know that there's much more to, to worship than just music. And by the way, this is not true of what I heard here this morning. I'll, I'll, let me say this to you, okay? This is not true of what I heard here this morning. But it's true of what I hear too much of. Many who study contemporary worship music have been alarmed by the rise of what we call the I, me songs. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Some of you have even heard that term. Uh, it's music that is focused on me and what I'm doing rather than God. And I praise God that that's not what we heard this morning. Okay. We have our music, everything about the church, what we do in the church has to be focused on bringing glory to God. That's Everything we do in our lives should be focused on bringing glory to God. To Jesus, his focus was always on that. And the self may ask, you know, why should we glorify the Father? Why should we worship him? And here's the thoughts. Because Jesus did, and we as faithful followers of Jesus are called to be like Jesus. And if we are being like Jesus, then we too have to be focused on the glory of God, don't we? Further even to that, Jesus says that a, that a servant is no greater and must, you know, must follow his master. Jesus is our master. He's teaching us these things. And that alone should be sufficient. That alone should be sufficient reason for us to glorify the Father, because Jesus did. But you know, let's remind ourselves of a few other things too, because it's important. Think of Genesis 1, verses 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything. Every person 
came from the creative hand of God. And I think I hear people say things like, well, can you imagine if? No, no. Without God, we do not exist. There is nothing to imagine. There's nothing to think. Without God, our minds are not here. Our thoughts are not here. Our souls are not here. Without God, we are not. Furthermore, God created humanity in his own image. And at the heart of that image is love. God loved humanity from the beginning, and he loved you and me before we were even born. You know, I keep thinking about the first letter of John, and, and we see some verses from it up there, where we are so often reminded that love comes from God. We love because he first loved us. He loves us even now, and he will love us into eternity. Let's go back to those words that began Jesus' prayer. For you granted him authority, he's talking about himself, you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that you know him, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Is this our vision? Is this our vision? That God stepped down into the world in Christ to set us on a journey to the place of God's glory. That's what we have. That's the promise. That one day we will be in eternity with God's glory and be able to, to sing to him directly. Jesus came to open the doors that we may participate in the glory of God just as he does. Just as he does. God continues to give life and to love anyone who would accept it. How can we come to any other conclusion than that God is worthy of glory? God is worthy of praise. God is worthy of worship because of what he has done and who he is in his very nature, his character. And when I do that, I cannot help but think of, of um, and this is one of the verses that, that anybody who's, uh, I, I spent time as a worship pastor, obviously, and, and one, of the, one of the verses that I always kept coming to my mind was Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29. Because I think they're ones that we really, really have to bear. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Repeat that one with me. Okay, read that with me. All right, ready? Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He will burn away the other things, but he will carry us through. But, you know, it's, it's a verse that, that constantly should be in our minds. Whenever, whenever we're worshiping God, whether it's privately or publicly, it should be, should be when we're in our devotions and, and especially during what we call worship services, right? We worship him with reverence and awe. He deserves all of that. He deserves all of it. Okay, to this point in the prayer, we have heard Jesus' absolute commitment to bringing glory to the Father. And the mission he has has controlled every aspect of his life, even to the crucifixion. And we think, of, by the way, of his, of his words in Matthew 6, where he says, thy will be done. Thy will be done. And, and talking to the Father. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. But now his prayer turns to his followers, his disciples. I have revealed to you those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. I, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew a certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. And they believed that you sent me. The disciples were given to Jesus. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? God gave the disciples to Jesus. God led them to Jesus when Jesus was here in, 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 in an incarnate form. And he brought those specific men to him. We know that their discipleship was based on their recognition that Jesus indeed came from God. Yes, we can say that the disciples weren't completely clear yet at this point on, on how the whole plan of God would work out. That clarity would come later in, in John chapter 24 and other places. 
But they did see Jesus as one sent from God, the Messiah, even then when they were hearing this prayer. They would have known that. They would have heard that. They understood that when they heard Jesus speak, they heard the word of God. Because of that, Jesus was able to entrust them with the gospel that they would take to the world now. If we consider, consider carefully Jesus' words and we know what is about to happen, I believe we find another one of those critical thoughts that we're looking for. Even though Jesus knew that his disciples would abandon him when he faced the cross, just in a short few hours, yet he was grateful for them and confident of, of their certainty and belief. Isn't that interesting? You know, they will do it. He has faith in them even though he knows they're going to abandon him. What a powerful thought that is. Why is it a powerful thought? Because it should tell each one of us, every last one of us who follow Jesus with great assurance that God does not abandon us because we fail at times. He fall, he's still there. We are never abandoned. You know, I know I fail at times. Um, you know, when, when I was ordained, some people brought me a sign that, they, that, that I could put on, my, on, my, on, the, on the podium at the front that said, don't worry, I don't practice what I preach either. Okay. Uh, because that's a reality, isn't it? Uh, somebody once, somebody a short while ago, I don't know why, I have no clue even to this day why, uh, said that he looked at me and he said, I don't talk to hypocrites. And he walked away. And I thought, then who do you speak to in the church? Because every one of us fails, don't we? Every one of us fails to live up sometimes or another to, to what we believe to be true. And how we should act, what we should be doing. I admit that. Anybody else want to admit to that? Oh, I see a few hands. Okay, good. Okay. It brings, should bring us a sense of joy and wonder, really that God still forgives and maintains his care for me, even though I fail. What a great comfort that should be to us to know that. It, it doesn't mean that I should ignore the fact that I failed. It means that I should, have, I sh I should face up to that. And, and that's one of the reasons I really liked it when, when, when we prayed today and we, we took a few seconds to admit, you know, to confess. Confession is good for the soul, they tell us. And I think it is. Because it, even though God forgives and loves us beyond it, Still, that doesn't mean that we should ignore that we make mistakes. We shouldn't. We should still be trying to deal with them. Now, here's the other part of this that's really interesting. Jesus does indicate, when he's talking about that, that obedience is part of glorifying God. Obedience is part of glorifying God. It might not seem obvious that obedience is actually a form of worship, but it is. When we obey God's commands or surrender to his will, we should not see it in the negative light. You know, I know some people do, they think, you know, they, I guess that's, that's the legalist heritage, you know, where they used to have all these rules that said, thou shalt not drink, thou shalt not smoke, thou shalt not play cards, thou shalt not go to a movie theater, thou shalt not wear makeup, you know. They used to have all these kinds of rules in churches and, and people would, would you know, uh, it, it just became rule-based. It's, it's just a legalist approach. Uh, and I know that some people think, oh, I better not do that because God's going to punish me. Uh, that's a negative approach. In fact, we should have a positive approach to obedience. We should, because what we're saying, if we have a positive approach, is that, that God is good, and God knows what's good for me, and therefore, I should do it because he knows, and he wants what's best for me. We should have a positive approach to obedience. And we should obey and we should trust him. That's the heart of what we have to do. That's, hard. that's part of glorifying God. And that's what, part of what Jesus is, is talking about too here. Actually, it reminds me of, a, of an, old, an old song. I don't know, any, how many of you are familiar with the old, the old hymn, Trust and Obey? Yeah, a few of you are. Okay, well, that's good. You know, what, you know how it goes, right? I don't know if I can sing it for you, but... <clears throat> When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, 
What a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And Jesus is telling us that and, and told them that even though he knew it was going to be a tough place in the world for his followers, he knew that they would suffer for being Christians. He knew that they would need strength from God to maintain the faith in the years ahead. And that's what was there. And I think about it. I pray for them. I have not praying for this world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. See, Jesus also prayed for the unity of his disciples. And friends, that's so important. We need to be guarded against disunity in the church. In a world that would constantly, and this is back to the problems we face, in the world would constantly attack the, our faith. And as it was with them, they needed to be one in heart and mind and spirit and vision. They could not afford to disintegrate into, into groups condemning each other and, and opposing each other. Unfortunately, that's the way the world has gone. And that's what we became, isn't it, in many ways. And then Jesus turns and he, and he prays something that is in many ways surprising. He prays for the future. And he says this, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you. Who's he praying for? Us. It may be 2,000 years later, but he's praying for us, folks. And I, I'm, I'm, this, one, this one, I love this one because it's one of the three times by my count that Jesus actually prays for the future, for, for, for future believers in the Gospels. And, and, and it, it really, in some ways, it's sort of, it's, it's, it should be a meaningful to us on that basis. Actually, I'll be honest with you. Um, as I look around at the modern church, I, I truly wonder if it has lost its way in many ways. And I'm not specifically talking about this church, you understand. I'm talking about the church in general in the world. Um, I see people, the statistics tell us that people are walking away from the church in, in large numbers or in ever increasing numbers. And we see large groups of Christians, they call themselves Christians, who do not claim to be part of any church. They, they, they are what we call the nuns. They're not in any denomination, they're not in any church, but they claim to be Christians. And I look at those things and I wonder what's going wrong. And one of the things I believe is going wrong is that we have lost just what Jesus is saying. We've lost the unity. Somehow we've lost the unity. Now be careful with that. When I say the unity, I'm not saying that we should be you know, showing unity with groups of churches that have, have decided that they're going to uh, rewrite the Bible to their own way of thinking or that they've got kinds of strange interpretations of things. But when it comes down to basics, the basic faith, we should be unified. And in order to be unified, folks, and this is the one that some people don't like, we have to be among the body. We have to be in a church with a community, with people. And friends, that's what this is partly about, isn't it? Communion. Communion. Together. Oneness. And that's what Jesus is, is saying. He's praying that that unity would be there among the people of the, of, the, of the church. As I go back to the last verses that we read, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that you may be 
one as we are one, I in them and you in me. So they may be brought to complete unity. And I think to myself, what an amazing set of words. We in our time, just as believers of all times, have been invited to join spiritually with the Father, with the Son, and with believers of history. We've been invited to join with them as though we were one in a unity. The unity we experience with Jesus should lead us to a oneness with the other believers. The unity with the Father and the Son and the Spirit means that God's glory will be shown to the world through us, just as it was through Jesus. And we will then have the reason to reach out to others and say, you should know this God. You should know this God. It's really an amazing thought that we could be one with the Father and the Son and the rest of the rest of believers in the world, isn't it? What a wonderful thing it could be. But it begins with repentance and prayer, and it's displayed in worship. It's displayed in glorifying God. Worship focuses our minds on the glory of God, and that's what it should do. Let's pray. Father, we do glorify you. You are the wonderful God who created everything around us. We, we know that, that this existence is because you loved and because you wanted a community of, of people to come with you. And so we ask you to bless our thoughts, help us to find our way through the, the, the morass that is this world and to focus on you and our worship should be directed to you. And so we, we just ask you as always to, to keep us, hold us, protect us, and keep our thoughts in the right places. And we will give you glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.